So it's week number four of our Bible reading for February, and we're wrapping up uh, today uh, our reading of First and Second Thessalonians, which means it's time to talk a little bit about what to do with the material in the letter. Right. Uh, one thing that struck me, because so much of this letter really focuses on Paul's relationship with the Thessalonians. Sure. Uh, from the angle of, uh, you know, really the first three chapters, a lot of that is about, I've been concerned about you, and, you know, I wanted Timothy to come check and make sure things are good, and when he gets that news, he's he's uh, he's thrilled about that, and he's celebrating. And one of the things uh, that struck me as I pondered that was the capacity uh, we have uh, to have an impact on each other, that no, no, no disciple is just sort of this island who lives to himself. Right. But as in the case of the Thessalonians, um, Paul is genuinely affected by what happens to them, good or bad. Right. Now, I think that that's an important observation. I think part of it, it it's a reminder that, you know, if, this is life. This matters to him at a level that it's easy for us to fail to, um, you know, bring the bear in our own lives, right? I mean, to be honest, sometimes it feels like, you know, church is just one other thing in the week, one other thing on our list of things to do, one other item on the calendar, as opposed to the center of life, and not just in terms of we order as a time runner, but, but mental, emotional, spiritual energy is so tied up in the church, the people of God, the work of God, salvation of souls, people growing and maturing, people staying faithful, that um, this is the center of Paul's mental, emotional, spiritual life. And and I think that's a challenge for us to, you know, not just, you know, make sure we're coming to services or Bible classes, things like that. That's not, not just a time management issue, but literally a a what motivates you in life, what really is where you spend the 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 actual self you know, right. invest yourself in. And that's where Paul's at on this. It, it, Paul's language is just crystal clear about yeah, that. In yeah. chapter 3, uh, describing his concern from them uh, in verse 1, when we could endure it no longer. Right. And then in verse 5 again, when I could endure it no longer. So uh, his concern for them was just getting to the breaking point. And then you press on through there. Long to see you. Uh, yeah. And, well, in, in um, uh, verse 8, for now we really live if you stand firm yeah. uh, in the Lord. And so, and so uh, you know, so much of Paul's uh, happiness was sort of writing on what he was going to hear about this group of disciples and how they would faring. And, and, and I will tell you, if I can relate to that a bit, because I know that there have been Sundays uh, when I was really laboring over a family or a disciple, and you, you know, you get up and you look out in the crowd and they're not there. Right. And I have literally had to sort of gather myself. Yeah. Yeah. And in spite of my really, really deep disappointment, preach. And I got to tell you, I've had the opposite effect too. I've stood up and there's someone I've been laboring with and working with, and uh, and 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 they show. Right, uh, you know, and maybe they come late, so I didn't see him beforehand. But I get, I get up, and there they are, sitting in the crowd. Right, and so I know personally what a difference that makes to me, and helps me uh, relate a little bit to Paul here. And so I just don't think we ponder enough the impact that we're having on other people, and even something as simple as my presence. You know, you know, I, people have said to me, "Well, you know, what? It doesn't matter whether I'm there or not. Nobody notices." And the truth is, you don't know who notices. <laughs> Yeah. And what uh, yeah. impact it might have on them spiritually. No, that's right. That's right. Uh, the other thing that, that stood out to me by way of application is this language in chapter 4. Because uh, you know, one of the things Paul does over and over again, he's, he commends them for doing well. And uh, in verse 1 of chapter 4, uh, he talks about how he had taught them to walk and please the Lord. But then he adds parenthetically, just as you actually do, which, so that raises the question, if they are doing the thing that he is talking about, why is he talking to them about it? And then you get down to verse 10, uh, verses 9 and 10, and he says, uh, you know, nobody needs to write to you about loving the brethren because you practice it, verse 10 says. And, right. so, and so twice in chapter 4, he mentioned things uh, that they're already 
doing well. The interesting thing to me is he doesn't leave it there. Right. That he gives them this three-word admonition twice in chapter four. I know you're doing this, but what I want you to do is to excel. I want you to excel still more. I want you to take what you're doing and I want you to to push that to the next level, to do even better. And so there is a sense in which we shouldn't be content with where we are. Right. No, that's exactly right. And I think that's why we never quit, you know, whether it's reading and studying and especially praying. Um, there's always room to grow. When have you when do you ever say you've loved enough? When do you ever say that you are pure and holy enough. You know, when you really start thinking about it, and I think part of why, David, sometimes we get spiritually satisfied and complacent is because we quit thinking about who God is, you know, and, 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 and who Jesus is. And when you lose sight of, you know, when we judge ourselves by ourselves, still a phrase of Paul from somewhere else, when we judge ourselves by ourselves, or I, you know, I judge myself against you or against even the elders or, you know, and so I said, say, I'm doing pretty good, or I'm right on track with where I need to be to be an elder when I'm older or whatever. Those are, you know, those are worthy intermediate goals. But when you take your eyes off Jesus, you know, you, you lose sight of how far you always have to go and that we're never done. And so I think about, you know, now you're back to Jesus in the Gospels, right? At best, we are unworthy servants, at best. And so, yeah, there's a complacency that's dangerous. And I, but I think a big symptom of that is we, we've, we, we stop thinking about God and Jesus. Yeah. So, so there's got to be a balance on the other side of that because— because the flip side is, well, do I just constantly feel like a spiritual fit? Agreed. No, that's right. Do that's I constantly right. feel like I'm— That's right. I, and I think there's some people who say, you know, I'm just not good enough. I know. And, right. And I don't think it's one way or the other. Uh, Paul is clearly happy as he writes this letter oh, yeah. with their progress and commends their progress uh, as a good thing. I, I just think the point is that, that we don't let ourselves— uh, develop, I'm, I'm going to call it a prideful sense sure. of having arrived. Right. Uh, I'm at the place I ought to be, and I have nothing left to do. Because I think the idea in Scripture is that that throughout life, our walk is an on-going process of growth. On-growing. I almost said on-growing. It, it works, Slip actually. Slip the tuck. Right, it does. Uh, <laughs> but, but, and that's it. That, that, uh, that, uh, that, that can become a slogan, I guess. <laughs> put, it, put it on a magnet and stick it on your fridge. But, uh, but, but, but I do think sometimes that uh, especially you, you talked about comparing ourselves to God. We compare ourselves the wrong way. When we look to the world and say, I'm not like the people out yeah, there. That's right. or, or even other disciples, maybe younger disciples, and say, here, I've made all this progress. Uh, I think that's the wrong measuring stick. Right. Uh, my, my goal is to be like Jesus. And I think the idea of Scripture is uh, that with every passing day, I continue to work toward that objective. In fact, um, we were talking about this in class on Wednesday, that there's a sense in which the more you grow, the more you realize how much you need to. And in other words, it's not like you think, well, I'm almost done. I'm, I've, I've been a Christian right. 50 years, and, and I just have a little bit left to do. It's almost the opposite. Right. It's almost as your knowledge grows, you realize how much more there is. Right. Still a line from Paul, again, another one of his letters, getting ahead of ourselves. But, you know, if I can paraphrase, the mature are the ones who know they're not mature. Right. You know, or the wise are the ones who know they're not yeah. wise. Yeah. You know, that paradox of that's actual maturity, that's actual wisdom, is to know I'm not that yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like an athlete. It's like a baseball player. Yeah. Uh, you know, a guy gets up and he has a good season. Maybe hits over three hundred. He doesn't come in, come into next season and say, "Well, look, I've, I've I'm doing great as a baseball player. I don't have any room to do better." You know, the great ones are the ones that throughout their whole life are constantly working to up their game. That's you right. Know, you know, people talk about Nolan Ryan and how he just had these. These really intense, disciplined rituals yeah. uh, every year to try to be better and better at what he did, and I think that's what we're trying to do. Or even Tom Brady, right? I mean, who's you know? Well, well I would never mention I Tom know, Brady's but, name in Texas. And whether you like him or not, I mean, that's one of the things that he's known for. Why his teammates loved him is even though he's recognized as the greatest to ever play the game already, it has been for a number of years. His work ethic continued until he retired here recently. His work ethic was still even in his forties. His work ethic was relentless. Even though he's already the greatest to play the game. Allegedly retired, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we'll see if it sticks this time. That sticks. Okay. <laughs> One other thought of application 
uh, from the Thessalonian letters, uh, we, we certainly ought to say something about the coming of the Lord because yeah. that is such a point of emphasis uh, yes. throughout the letters. And um, yeah, both first and second Thessalonians. That's yeah, right. and so and so maybe we ought to go back to something that we said I think last week we were talking about questions people have about this, mm -hmm. and that is this need for for constant readiness. So yeah. in chapter five, for example, after talking about um, the nature of his return. Um, he says in verse six, so then let us not sleep as others do, but be alert and sober. Right. Maybe that word sober needs a little bit of attention. Yeah, yeah. You hear the word sober, and usually we think of it in terms of like not being drunk. Not drunk. Yeah, yeah. Not, not not drinking alcohol, not being drunk. Which he goes on to say, for those who sleep do their sleep yeah. at night, and those who are drunk get drunk at night. Right. So. But but you know, and there it's I mean, it's, you know, he's it's, it's kind of metaphorical because yes. his his night and day are not literal day and night. It's 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 spiritual night versus you know the day of of you know living before God. Um, yeah. So I mean, part of what's sober there is just you know serious minded. You know. A, a, the part of why we, you know, to use the drunkenness metaphor, you know, somebody who's drunk, their mind can't focus, their mind's not alert, um, their in, mind misses, insensitive to danger, insensitive to danger. That's right, oblivious. Um, that's why, that's why, for example, on these college campuses, yeah, young ladies get themselves in trouble, correct, when they go to a frat party, get drunk, and lose their their sense of danger yeah and, and some predatory and, young man takes advantage and of her and then they wind up yeah they wind up being yeah. a dangerous situation to which they're oblivious where she might have been able to you know resist or call for help or whatever if she hadn't been drunk exactly. and again not not blaming her for what happens to her in, in the sense that the you know, young men shouldn't do what they do taking advantage of them but she it does put me at risk but, but her ability to recognize the danger and flee right. is limited because right. she's incapacitated exactly and and so yeah there is a danger there and and so yeah that that's the issue and and i think david you know part of his point that and i think one of the ways that we are not always sober is especially maybe when we're younger but but any of us you know, we, we think more about Judgment Day when we die, assuming that we get, you know, a certain amount of life. And this is a reminder that, you know, there's another way to wind up before God, you know, and that's Jesus can come back at any moment. And when we recognize that, part of, I think, the sober living Paul's calling us to is recognizing, you know, I may not have a couple years to get some of this sin straightened out in my life, get reconciled with my spouse if our marriage is broke. I mean, whatever it may be, I may not have two, three, four, five years you know, or my time, my assumed time frame to get my life right. There needs to be a sense of urgency that, you know, the, the world is hanging by a thread. He's coming like a thief in the night. We shouldn't be surprised because we know the thief's coming, but everyone's going to be surprised in the sense that nobody knew exactly when the thief was coming. Right. And so Christians don't have an inside, you know, inside note on this either. And so part of sober living is quit assuming that, you know, you've got your 80 years to go ahead and get your life cleaned up and fixed. That's, not, that's actually not clear-minded. No, that's not, no, not at all. That's not prudent. No, thinking. not alert to the danger of it's, his imminent return. Yeah, it's fantasy. Absolutely. Uh, I like that if you continue on down through that context in verse 11, you have the therefore, right? Right. So, so why have I been saying all of this to you? Well, therefore, encourage each other and build up one another just as you are also doing. There's an Excel still more passage, by the way. Right. Um, I, and, and I think the point is that, you know, how should you be conducting yourself day by day? If you have a clear-headed mind about the nature of the Lord's return, how should you be conducting yourself? It seems to me one of the things he's saying is you guys ought to be taking care of each other and supporting and encouraging each other in your walk yeah. to get you ready, to be ready for this imminent return of the Lord, imminent in the sense that it could be any moment at any time. I just think that is a life-changing reality. Right. And I think we have spent some time, so much time so often arguing over the nature of his return and the timing of his, re his return. We don't live like he is going to return yeah. anymore. And so one of the important takeaways from the Thessalonians, I think, is to live with that sober mind that is ready at any moment for the trumpet to sound and for the Lord to come. Right. Absolutely. So as we make our way one last time through the letter, uh, now that we know how the letter was speaking to this church family, we need to think about how it speaks to us and what its message is for us and, uh, and to the abiding value for disciples of every generation. As you read through one last time this week, take, take a moment 
to read all the way through each letter in one sitting with that thought in mind. What is the letter saying to me and how can it help me live my life to the glory of God today?